Hi, and welcome to the recording of episode eight of Search Marketing Scoop, SEM Rush's um, show that happens just about every two weeks, sometimes every three weeks or so, that discusses the latest SEO and paid search news. Uh, we're just going to get started recording the episode proper in about three or four minutes time. Uh, we'll just let a few people join in and say hello, hopefully in the meantime. We have been until now broadcasting live on Facebook and Twitter. But this time we're broadcasting somewhere else. So we're broadcasting live, of course, on the SEM Rush YouTube channel. So it'll be interesting to see how much interaction we get here. We will, of course, get a lot more um, views or listens um, f of our audio podcast than, than we actually do uh, get the live um, video stream. Um, the audio podcast, if you go to searchmarketingscoop.com, that will take you to a blog post on SEM Rush at the moment. And you can scroll down that and find links to the audio podcast on both uh, iTunes and uh, also Android. So um, hopefully that'll cover most of your devices. But um, just before we get started, um, who is um, watching us live? Hopefully there's a few people watching us live now. We've got about 16 watching us live. The numbers will go up a little bit there. Um, if you're in the chat, if you'd like to chat and say hello, um, let us know your name. Let us know where in the world that you happen to be watching us. And of course, we're going to be talking about the latest um, SEO and paid search stories. So if there are any stories that have had happened recently that you think merit discussion that we're not talking about, feel free to include that in the chat and we'll see if we can chat about that as well. We've got um, um, the podcast link that is also appearing in the chat there. So you, you, that's where you can listen directly live. But of course, if you want to subscribe um, using iTunes or Android, then go to that look, uh, that link, uh, searchmarketingscoop.com, um, and then you'll be able to find the direct links to iTunes and Android. So um, we're up to about 20 people watching us live. It'll keep on going up a little bit. Um, so as I said, you know, tell us um, where in the world you happen to be watching us, um, what kind of SEO and paid search challenges perhaps that you're having at the moment. And um, We've got Craig Campbell. Hi, Craig. Um, Craig's a regular presenter for um, SEM Rush. It's uh, the different webinars out there. Hope you're you're doing well, Craig. And um, um, it's um, good to see you. Hopefully, there'll be a few other people chatting there as well. So, in the next minute or so, I'm going to introduce the guests, but only after we have the the, the proper start to the podcast. Um, so, just bear with me for a quick second and we will start the podcast recording properly. Google shrinks meta description snippets. AdWords is going to advise that HTTP is less secure. Google are looking for unanswered questions and parallel tracking will be required for all AdWords accounts. Broadcasting live on the SEM Rush YouTube channel. This is Search Marketing Scoop, the SEM Rush show that brings together the top PPC and SEO folk to discuss the current search headlines and how they impact you. Hi, I'm David Bain, and let us meet today's guests. So, first up is a man who has been in the SEO industry for the past 12 years. He is the head of SEO at the luxury fashion e tailer, Farfetch. Welcome to the scoop, Matt Rideout. Thanks, David. Nice to be here. Looking forward to today's session. Thanks, Matt. Thank you for joining us. And next up, well, he's a paid search expert who's spoken at SMX, the State of Search, HeroConf, and many other places. He's the owner of Zato. Welcome, Kirk Williams. Thank you so much, David. Great to be here. Thank you, Kirk. So let us go back to Matt for story number one, and that is... Google shrinks meta description snippets. So back in December of last year, Google increased its meta description from about 160 to about 230 characters. However, Danny Sullivan has tweeted that search snippets have recently reduced in length. So Matt, what do you make of this one? Thanks, David. And this is definitely um, a hot topic in the SEO uh, world, I think. Um, those of you that, that follow me on Twitter may have noticed a, a tweet that I put out there. Um, certainly, 
um, noticing that, that pretty much half the people I followed in SEO were talking about the meta description change and the other half were talking about the other people that were talking about the change. So it was obviously a big, big sort of um, discussion point. For me, it, it's, it's a really interesting move. Um, I think, first of all, something that Danny said, I believe, um, in Twitter or on Twitter, uh, he mentioned that you know, there was no official guidelines to say that the rules had changed. It was just an assumption that actually, you know, SEO started to change um, the lengths um, to see what happened. And um, when that change ultimately came back to, to a smaller number for some queries, I think a lot of people were concerned about the changes and what the message from Google was uh, actually coming through. Um, for, for me, it kind of makes sense that, that there's a dynamic element to meta descriptions. Um, I've noticed it for a long time, and I'm, I'm sure others have as well. It depends on the, the length of your search query and the type of search that you're performing. Now, typically, if you have a short search and you are searching for uh, one or two keywords, then ultimately the kind of response that you get back from Google you know, the kind of message that you get in the search results uh, is ultimately trying to, to direct you to the answer. Whereas I think when you have a longer um, query or a phrase or a question to ask Google, then actually the, the amount of text you get back, even still now, still varies uh, and is still much longer. So for me, there's a question there as well of, of really, um, has anything really changed? I, I think that, you know, it's, for me, I think Google is, is trying to uh, make sure it gives the, the users the best experience. Um, and, and a part of me also believes potentially that, that maybe Google is trying to answer questions for certain queries without having to prompt people to websites. So if there are longer snippets, longer descriptions, are users and customers potentially getting the answers to what they need? Um, in the search result with the longer descriptions for some queries, whereas others kind of may be irrelevant. So if um, an SEO, uh, a content marketer, is writing a meta description for a page, um, would your general advice to be to keep it under 160 characters now? I, I think it, it really depends on, on what your website setup is, is for. I think um, it, it's, it's a question that's been asked certainly within our business that we were kind of thinking, how are we going to approach this, this uh, issue? Do we go under 160? Do we do everything at 160? Or do we just do what we feel is right for the page? And I think it, it really depends on what your, what your current setup is, the size of your website, how many pages this, this actually impacts. Um, you know, websites, e-commerce businesses like ours, is, you know, has millions and millions of pages. This kind of change is not something we're going to be able to manually edit. Um, it, it's something which you know needs to continue uh, using rules and and kind of larger kind of uh, strategies. I, I think if you've got a smaller website, you're probably in a position where you could probably test and and see what happens. Um, I, th I think what's also important is is to to make sure that you that whatever your website or the business you you're working for, that you have a solution that answers your needs through the meta description. Um, and I think that, that that's kind of critical. Okay, and I, I guess the one of the follow-up que follow question in relation to that is, um, I think Danny Sullivan used the, the, the phraseology snippets rather than a kind of meta description. Um, so does that mean that Google are now looking to take a snippet from a web page and publish that where the meta description used to be? Um, are we seeing Google um, being a little bit more AI driven in terms of what content they choose to take underneath the page title in its search results? That's a, it's a good point. Um, I think you know Google has to some extent done this for a while anyway. Um, for those of you that, that have seen this happen, if you write a description that is not necessarily relevant to the, the page content, or if Google thinks that there's a better description, it will pull that in. It will usually use the content that's either displayed on the page anyway. So that has happened for a while. Um, and we've certainly seen some interesting tests um, of that happening. I, I think it, it does make sense if the content on the page is potentially more relevant and more um, fresher, um, if that's the right word, mm -hmm. um, in terms of, of the content and serving the user, then then why not replace it? If the description hasn't been updated in two or three years, then potentially that's out of date. So, so let's update that um, using AI, let's using their their algorithm. And I think that it makes complete sense. I think 
you know, also if you don't have a meta description, it just pulls it in straight away uh, from whatever page content you have, which works on some instances, obviously, but some pages that doesn't that don't have the, the appropriate content, it might look a bit strange. But even then, I, I've seen instances where Google will pull in meta descriptions from uh, other sources or other pages just to create something. So it's it's really interesting, actually. Okay, so don't rush to change your meta description lengths at the moment. Just just keep an eye on what Google is doing and and yeah. be prepared to perhaps amend things in the future. That's, that sounds about right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, over to Kirk for story number two, and that is AdWords are going to warn advertisers that HTTP pages are less secure. So Kirk, what's happening here, and why are AdWords doing this? Yeah, I think there's a couple of different things with this. So um, first of all, it sounds like uh, with with Chrome um, being released in July, there's a there's an update coming. It's like version 68, right? I mean, geez, that's a lot of versions. Um, but Chrome is going to be releasing this version, and <clears throat> they're they're kind of getting more uh, they're getting more and more um, alarmist about your HTTP pages. HTTP pages are not secure. Um, so kind of step one is that uh, I think I think they're 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 moving from a hey it's a good idea to be more secure and uh, we're just gonna keep seeing um, these alarming like alerts to people and and it sounds like from what Google's releasing even to the extent of like there's gonna be like this giant red text with this triangle and not secure and like you know, everyone panic. Um, so it, just in terms of general marketer knowledge, like it's good for us to realize that that, that does affect users in that. Um, in, in terms of how it actually affects ads and AdWords, um, beyond that it is, it, the, I think the second part to this is that it sounds like Google is actually going to start automatically redirecting HTTP ads, if that's, if that's what you have in your, you find the URL, they're gonna start automatically redirecting that to your site if your site prefers um, HTTPS. So uh, that that's gonna begin the week of June 11th. So kind of good to know because that's one of those things where like, you know, whenever, whenever they go in and actually start automatically doing something to your ads, it's probably something that we should know about. Mm. Um, they do say that you'll be able to see in your ad version history um, as well, uh, just, just kind of, uh, that, that that's happening going from HTTP and HTTPS. Um, the ad, ad version history is only available in the new UI, which we're gonna all have to use by the end of this year anyway. So let's just start getting used to it. Um, and, and they also note that they're gonna be warning us in AdWords too, if, if we are using HTTP uh, rather than S, we'll see what that looks like too. But, but it's basically, it sounds like they're, they're kind of putting all hands on deck here to say, Hey, we're we're really trying to shift people over to to uh, secure websites, and if you're doing that with an ad and you haven't already updated your ads to be HTTPS, we're just going to go ahead and do that for you on the back end. So you sh you should be aware that that's happening. So do you think it's happen. right for a landing page to be HTTPS or necessary for a landing page to be HTTPS when it doesn't actually ask for any um, user information at all? So I that to me that's almost a, a better question for like a, a, an SEO or a developer like in my opinion I usually go along with what Google and what they're saying so like my personal website and that I've done SSL on that I've done HTTPS it's not hard that's what people are saying to do that's what I'm doing uh, especially if you're e-commerce and all that, you, you have to, like if you're going to be collecting payment, you know, payments. Um, and then what, what many people don't know, and this is kind of important, is that actually with your analytics, if you have an e-commerce site that's HTTP, but then you, you run them to an HTTPS um, checkout, uh, ch you know, checkout event. Um, and then once they go back to your website, that's HTTP, if they do like, so this happens a lot with someone checks out and then they go back to this checkout confirm page that's back on HTTP. You actually lose that in Google, in, at least in Google Analytics, um, that, that drops off there for, for people with tracking. So, so again, at this point, in my opinion, like they're pushing for this, it's really not that hard anymore. I, I say go for it, get a, Get get secured. Get your website secure, and 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 then and then make sure you switch your ads over as, as well. Ad landing pages. So, okay. Um. So you say and ask an SEO about it. I might just ask Matt uh, about that just in a second. But the guy's um, standing to, there. <laughs> <laughs> but but just to close up um, on this topic from yourself. Um. Would you say that in general advertisers need to 
ensure that there aren't warnings in their account and it's going to be best practice for advertisers to move to HTTPS on AdWords in the future? I think so. Yeah, I, I would I would say to do that, I would say get that going. One thing I'll note, and this is kind of the action step, is if if you are using HTTPS and you know you've just been relying on that to redirect, I would suggest using editor um, and there's disagreement on this, so you know, feel free to do your research, but I've done this with our clients. I would suggest going through those ads and like using editor, it's really not a hard edit, but, but changing everything manually over to HTTPS so that you avoid that redirect. Um, there's just, I just don't like redirects and ads. I just, I think that it, it, it's asking for trouble down the road of things like tra tracking, dropping off, stuff like that. Just get your ads switched over to HTTPS and you don't even have to worry about this. So, Okay, well, you don't like redirects and ads. Um, we, we might actually be talking about um, another story in relation to that uh, just in a little bit when we come back to you. But uh, Matt, um, just before we get on to your next topic, um, HTTPS, should every website be secure nowadays? Every page and every website? Uh, I think we're at a stage now where we where, where websites have to become secure. I think, you know, the, the the kind of the latest stats, uh, the numbers escape me exactly right now, but the percentage of websites that feature in the top positions in in search engines um, is ex extremely high. And I, I think that, you know, in terms of a, a secure experience, people expect that kind of experience now. And I think that it, it, it's critical for users to to have that. Um, and it, you know, it, it kind of makes sense. And um, you know, certainly from an SEO perspective, I would I would always encourage um, people to, to to go secure if they can. Okay, well, so with Matt, um, someone in a forum stumbled upon Google adding this um, to a search result, and that is, get the answer that you're looking for added to the web. Your question will be shared anonymously with online publishers who may be interested in answering it. So, Matt, what, what is that one all about? It's interesting. It's an interesting move, actually. Um, when I saw it, it kind of took me by surprise because it's, it seems to almost be a, a kind of older school method of, of providing an answer. You're looking back at kind of Yahoo Answers days, that, that kind of environment. And, you know, I, I kind of had the discussion with a few colleagues about what this could mean. And that there's a few, I guess there's a few possibilities of what this could mean if, if, if it kind of does get rolled out. And firstly, whether or not, you know, you have brands or websites actually starting to answer questions for people. And are those answers going to start appearing in Google in replacement of search results? Potentially, could happen. Um, or alternatively, is is this something that is going to be leveraged as data or used by Google as a way of then giving publishers the chance to create content for to, to answer the question that's being submitted? There's a couple of options there, and it's it's really interesting. Actually, I'm, I'm not entirely sure where it's going to go, but it's. Um, it's, yeah, maybe it's Google wants strange. to compete with Answer the Public. Maybe that's what it is. They say, <laughs> maybe. They say, maybe. Um, <laughs> in the, well, as part of this, Google say there's, they're going to share the information with publishers uh, who may be interested in answering the question. And th that was a bit of a concern to me because I was thinking, okay, are they going to be sharing it to only a select group of publishers? You know, is it going to be publicly available? Do, do you have any thoughts on whether it might be just only to a select group of publishers? It, it's it's really interesting actually that it's one of the questions that came up when I was debating it earlier. Um, that actually, um, you, you know, what's stopping a, a brand kind of writing um, that they're the best at something? So if if a question is who are the best at I don't know creating shoes, you could have shoe company. A that say we are the best at creating these shoes, and they could essentially just go straight to the top. It's it's not going to work like that, is it? You know, I, I think that in reality, Google's going to understand that there are kind of aggregators, there are uh, authorities in certain areas, and and that certain questions are going to be more relevant for certain types of websites and brands to answer. Uh, I think that that maybe where there are situations to help answer very niche questions, then it makes complete sense that there's a, a, an industry expert or an industry um, authority that is in the position or, or a number of websites are in a position to answer that question. But again, who knows really, it, you know, you'd think that Google would assume that kind of way of thinking, but, but you never know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would certainly like to see a follow up to, to, to this because it's, 
it's a small test, but it, it, it could potentially be significant, certainly if they roll it out a little bit more and they, they, they end up involving maybe a select group of publishers and you've got issues with, is this really net neutrality? Actually, Google um, giving select um, publishers certain information about the kind of content that, that needs to be published that people are looking for. So perhaps it's going to be publicly available in in, in Keyword Planner or, or some other other tool. So so hopefully yeah. we can watch the space and, and see further further developments in the future that, that will assist the life of SEOs. That, that's always a good thing to happen. Hopefully. <laughs> Well, the final story goes to Kirk, and that is starting on the 30th of October, parallel tracking will be required for all AdWords accounts. So, Kirk, well, to begin with, what is parallel tracking? Yeah, so it's funny because of these two stories, um, I actually, like, don't object to Google doing either of them. So uh, that that's kind of rare um, for, for Google to release something big that affects things. Parallel tracking, uh, I don't I don't think is necessarily a bad idea. Although sometimes when things you know get into it, we see what actually happens. Um, basically, the idea is let's just simplify it. Two two types of tracking. One is linear, and that's um, someone clicks and that takes them through. As you said, you know, there's like redirects, right? The redirect, there's the tracking, all that. Then they finally get to the website. Um, the landing page, that's that's a that's an incredibly short amount of time. But one of the things that Google has noted, especially from a mobile experience, um, is that especially with slower slower networks and that, uh, that that can actually turn into a few seconds, which is seconds is death, you know, in in mobile clicks. Um, so for them, they're 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 going down the way of parallel tracking, which would be basically, um, at, at the same time when you click on an ad at the same time that the tracking starts going through um, so that we marketers get our data, um, then they're going to immediately go to that landing page. So there's not going to be the redirects and that kind of thing. They'll just hop right from your ad to the landing page, which, which again, kind of at a face value thing, I, I love, I mean, that's a great idea, right? I mean, I, that's, that's where they want to go. We want them to get there ultimately. Um, so the, it sounds like there might be some things, though, that everyone needs to be be aware of. One of the major things that they've been trumpeting far and wide on this is, especially if you're using third-party tracking systems, all they're really saying right now is check with them and make sure that this will work with them. Um, so we're, we're, there, there's definitely going to have to be more that comes on on figuring out what all that looks like. Um, so yeah. Oh, oh, and I think one other key thing to, to be aware of that I that I noticed when I was looking into this is it does sound like it has to be HTTPS the whole way through that in order for it to work. So if if you have one HTTP in there somewhere in that in that path, then it's going to revert to linear tracking from from what I uh, from what I saw. Right. Okay. So are there any downsides to this, or is this only positive news for publishers? Um, I think. At this point, what I see as the downsides are that they're still trying to iron all this out so that it actually works. <laughs> so especially with, I think third party tracking right now is probably the, the single biggest downside of like, they need to make sure that, they need to make sure that, because usually in the way that linear works is that third party tracking is just is just part of that process. Okay. Um, and so they just, they're, they're just trying to make sure that all of that's gonna work work together so that we can we can see that data. Okay, um, so obviously we're talking about a few months uh, in advance here, but that date, 30th of October, will come ahead fairly quickly. Um, so you mentioned that if there are certain tracking scripts that are perhaps HTTP or elements within there um, that aren't secure, that, that may actually stop the whole process working. Does that mean that um, if any tracking script or redirect in there that it that is an https that would mean an ad would be disapproved um i don't i don't think so um full transparency as i'm digging in this it is a little bit of a rabbit hole thing um where the more you get in and i'm not a developer or the son of a developer um but from what i could tell it, it at this point, it's just going to revert to that linear tracking. I'm not 100% sure, to be honest, what happens October 30th when it says it's going to be required for all AdWords accounts. Um, possibly that's going to be part of the play where they're really pushing hard for the SSL and that. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm. let's call that one of the action steps that we all need to look into and figure out. <laughs> right, okay, we're well, talking about action steps. Um, 
this just about takes us to the end of the eighth episode, but there's just uh, time for another actionable tip uh, from each of our guests. So related to or not necessarily related to what we've been discussing so far, whatever they feel fit. Uh, so Matt first. Um, Matt, what is your actionable tip for today? Um, somewhat related to the topic, um, but I, I would actually go uh, go a bit bold and actually test um, not having meta descriptions on uh, a set number of pages and do a comparison versus um, a, a control group of pages that do have them. Uh, use new search console uh, interface and data that they provide and measure the uplift of click-through rates um, for mobile and desktop and see the impact. Simple as that. That's that's a, that's a great thing. Um, do you think that any website can do that, or how many visits roughly do you need per month to be able to do that kind of test? That's a question. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I I think you, if you've got, I think a certain number in the thousands, I think you've got a, a reasonable uh, level of kind of. Um, acceptance of the data but obviously if you've got very low numbers it's probably not worth testing at that that, that level yet um but yeah certainly websites with a a sufficient amount of traffic probably worthwhile doing great so, okay well you can find matt over at farfetch.com and also writing his men's fashion blog at kingsdonroots.co.uk and now kirk um kirk what's your actionable tip yeah, um, make sure if you if you do have uh, an SSL site, make sure that your ads are just pointing to HTTPS right from the beginning. Um, and then on parallel tracking, there is a way in the new UI to actually test um, those. And you know you can you can you can Google it and see that, but it'll walk you through how. Um, I think you have to go into accounts, settings, tracking, something like that. And then it allows you to see that's where you can toggle parallel tracking on if you want. Um, you can test your URLs to see before that. So just play around with that. If it works out, great. Try starting, you know, go ahead and toggle parallel tracking on, but like watch it like a hawk because it is affecting URLs. So be careful with that. Um, so yeah, give those give those a try. Great advice. So uh, don't wait until October the 30th before you start testing to see if um, yeah, exactly. it's working. You just uh, get things working now. So you can find Kirk over at zetomarketing.com. I've been your host, David Bain. You can also find me over at digitalmarketingradio.com. We will be recording the next episode, episode nine of Search Marketing Scoop at the same time, same place, the SEM Rush YouTube channel on Wednesday the 13th of June. That's in three weeks time. When my guests are scheduled to be SEM Rush friends Andy Drinkwater from IQSEO and AG Wilcox from B2 Lift. In the meantime, thanks not only to Matt and Kirk for this episode, but also for you for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, subscribe to the audio podcast. So just head over to searchmarketingscoop.com and find the link there to your preferred Apple or Android flavor of podcatcher. But until next time, be fantabulous and do one thing that scares you. Adios.